On this episode, we visit Portland, Maine for the Kids and Transportation Education Program. Then we head to Cambridge, Massachusetts for the Golden Shoes Treasure Hunt. Cambridge Walks is the coalition behind Golden Shoes and other walking promotions. In Hartford, the Connecticut Bicycle Coalition has issued a report, Deadly by Design. A National Heritage Corridor follows the Blackstone River from Worcester, Massachusetts to Providence, Rhode Island. In Burlington, Vermont, the group Locomotion promotes walking and bicycling. In Brunswick, Maine, an historic pedestrian bridge has a modern problem where it ends at a busy road. And finally, we travel to New Hampshire for a covered bridge with pedestrian walkways along both sides. Stay tuned! We're in Portland, Maine, talking with Eric Herman, who's coordinator of the Kids and Transportation Program of the Greater Portland Council of Governments. What is the Kids and Transportation Program? Uh, the Kids and Transportation Program is a program designed to teach kids uh, about alternatives to cars. And as a coordinator of that, what do you do? Well, most of my time I spend either in a classroom trying to promote these ideas, uh, either building it into a science curriculum or a health curriculum with a school, or I spend time trying to get into a classroom to do that. Uh, there's a bit of an obstacle in that a lot of people, when you say you teach alternatives to cars, they kind of scratch their head and say, which would be what, a horse? Well, <laughs> what is it? What are the alternatives? Well, the alternatives that I push mostly are uh, bicycling and walking um, and public transportation. Okay. You got a classroom of kids, they've never taken the public transportation, the bus, don't know how. Uh, how do you get started on that? Well, actually, a step before that is I get started by educating the teachers. So one of the things I do is I offer a teacher's class. Um, it's amazing how many teachers have phobias about using the bus because they've never been on the bus. Uh, and the best way to teach teachers or kids is to actually get them on it. So uh, whether it's a teacher's class or a class with students, we'll actually go over basic map reading skills, then we'll work into learning how to read a schedule, which can be pretty complex uh, if you haven't done it, and then actually um, put some money in their hand, get them on the bus, take the trip that they planned. Uh, and once they've done it, they realize how easy it is, and their mobility is increased as a result. Yeah, and you, you talk about mobility. W what are the benefits to, to children to, to be able to take the bus? Well, it's, a, it's actually... A, just as much about self-empowerment as it is uh, an environmental, um, environmentally sound choice uh, because all the kids that are under 16 are either not able to, not able, well they're obviously not able to drive themselves but they're um, dependent on someone else to drive them around so if their parents recognize that they're uh, capable to take the bus um, or safe to walk through the streets or safe to ride their bike uh, then they will promote that and the idea is that if the kids do it now um, when they're older, they're going to look back on that and that's going to be a very comfortable experience. So they're more likely to do it as an adult, um, both because they'll know it exists and also because they won't have had a bad experience with it. So do you uh, do much beyond what you do inside the schools? Uh, yeah, this uh, year we've actually started to branch out into summer festivals and we put on our first uh, actually our second annual, but our first Urban Earth Day uh, that included the Human Powered Vehicle Parade. Um, so by using a parade, we were able to tap into the general public um, and catch anybody. Uh, and the, per the idea with the parade was anything human powered could enter the parade. Uh, garden carts, pogo sticks, skateboards, whatever you want. And uh, that's what we had. So we got great media coverage, um, which again increases awareness of the idea and we tapped into a new market. We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, talking with Jeff Walker with the Cambridge Public Health Department. Hi. What do you do for the department? Well, I do lots of things, but one of the things I'm doing this May is getting the people of Cambridge out walking all over the city to look for golden shoes. Golden shoes. Now, what's, what's the gimmick here? Uh, what we decided was, for years, we've been telling people all the health benefits of walking, why it's good for you, what it does to, to prevent certain illnesses like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. 
Um, people listen, but it doesn't necessarily change their behavior. So what we thought we'd do is just let them have a lot of fun and get out walking. So we hit 100 gold shoes around the city in places where people walk, made sure all of them were wheelchair accessible so we could convince people to just be out and f be physically active in whatever area was most comfortable and have people out looking for these shoes. In the process, they're walking all over Cambridge. So what do these shoes look like? The uh, shoes look like this. They're special gold shoes with a certificate attached that says, if you found one, you've won a free pair of New Balance walking shoes. Um, New Balance is the sponsor of the event this year, along with the Cambridge Health Alliance. And people who find these walking shoes, um, these gold shoes, and get a free pair of sneakers will then get entered into a grand prize drawing, which is a more than a thousand dollar walking shopping spree across the city. Um, a lot of the local merchants have also agreed that walking is good for their business and they want to promote walking, so they've all contributed gift certificates stretching from one end of the city to the other. And how are you able to combine this with your other education campaigns? Well, what we do in building up for the event, last year was the first year we did the event and people um, found out about it pretty early in the month and got very excited as the month went on. It was very important that it was a month long to keep it sustainable and really get people out there. Um, what we did in preparation this year was we went into the schools, worked with elementary school students, worked with senior citizens, um, different community groups, asked them to paint gold shoes for us, um, which they had a lot of fun doing. And at the same time, city officials came in, our vice mayor, Henrietta Davis, Harold Cox, chief public health officer, and people were excited to see them and hear them talk about walking safety, what the city's doing to make Cambridge more walkable, and the real health benefits of walking. So we use every opportunity to get the educational word out. And I assume things went pretty well last year if you're doing it again this year. What, what sort of evaluation do you have? Yeah. Um, last year went um, extremely well. We didn't expect, expect the, um, the turnout and the excitement that we got. Um, I got a lot of phone calls. In the course of the month, I got 648 phone calls. Um, was able to speak with or return calls to each of those people. And more than 80% of those folks said that they had either started walking because of this event or walked, but were certainly out walking much more. Um, and I had some really nice phone calls from, from small children who were um, trying to coax me into telling them where I was hiding the shoes. Um, it's cute when it comes from kids. I also got a lot of calls from parents who were um, up every morning very early before school because their kids were so excited and wanted them to go walking with them. So one of the big things we do is we make sure all the kids in the city know about it um, through informationals we do in the public schools. They go home and they get their parents out walking with them and it's one of the best ways to get a family activity to happen is to have a, a kid sort of whining for um, that's how they want to spend their Saturday. So, and Have other cities shown an interest in this? Yeah, we actually, um, in having received a certain amount of, um, of press last year, other cities across the country found out about it and there were about 13 requests from the west coast down to the south for how do we do something like this ourselves? How much work was it? What was involved? We were able to put together a really um, concise presentation that is a how-to packet for um, creating a community initiative like this and it's connected to our website, the um, Cambridge Public Health website, which is www.cambridgepublichealth.org and you can always call me. Um, I'd be glad to speak with you or give you more information. My phone number is 617-665-3834 and it's Jeff Walker. We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, talking with Jessica Collins, who's a project manager of the Institute for Community Health. What is ICH? The Institute for Community Health is a new organization. Um, it's a collaboration um, from the different healthcare systems in Cambridge who came together to form this research and education institute. So we do evaluation um, and pilot research on overweight prevention, physical activity initiatives, and mental health um, issues within the Cambridge and Somerville community. Now, and what's the connection between ICH and Cambridge Walks? Cambridge Walks is a, collabor uh, a collaborative of organizations that started last fall. Organizations from Cambridge and Somerville who came together to discuss walking promotion. Walking is free, it's easy, most people can do it, um, and people felt like Cambridge and Somerville are very walkable cities, you know, two by three miles, um, and that it was something that we could sell to the people to get out there and take care of themselves. 
and um, so the public health department has taken leadership in Cambridge Walks um, and started several initiatives, one being Walk Your Child to School Day, um, Golden Shoes, and third, these pocket maps. Okay, let's see those pocket maps. What are those? Um, the pocket maps are actually, uh, we modeled these after a woman, Rosemary Jason, who, who does these for biking. She has a several um, different series of bike pathways across Massachusetts, and I saw them once, and I thought this would be great for walking. Um, so it tells you the distance, it tells you the number of steps, the amount of time it takes to walk. Um, anyone can do it, they can go out and make their own route, and we have said that we would fund getting them made to make um, a packet. They're easy, you can stick them in your pocket. We figured if families didn't have anything to do on a Saturday morning, they could, you know, pick a certain map and get out there and walk it. Along the routes there are different things to see, um, historical sites, cultural sites, bakeries, um, they're all starting and ending at a tea stop, tea, the, not the metro, um, and they also have safety tips and our mantra of 215, which is two hours um, or less of TV watching a day, one hour physical activity day, and five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So we're trying to get across health messages and also give people ideas to just get out and explore your own city. It's easy. It's a beautiful city. You know, here's a little guide to help you. Are these difficult and expensive to produce? Um, no, actually. Well, Rosemary Jason, the woman yeah. who originally designed them, she um, decided that she would do it half price for us, actually. Um, we chose not to get them laminated because that's actually the most, the most costly part of it. Um, but basically, Jeff, the co-chair of Cambridge Walks, and I went out. It took an hour to do each route. Um, we, I had a pedometer, so that was no problem. We gave her the directions. You can see here that there's wording of the actual direction. Take a left here, take a right there. Um, and it was very fast. She's excellent, very creative. Um, so it's not very expensive at all, or nor is it time consuming. We're in Hartford talking with David Hiller, who's director of the Connecticut Bicycle Coalition. What is the coalition? Well, the coalition is the advocacy group for bicyclists and pedestrians in the state of Connecticut. So we work on um, uh, geometric design of the highways and roads, uh, land use planning, communities, sprawl, smart growth issues. Y'all came out with a report in October. What was it? Uh, we released a report called Deadly by Design uh, in October of 2001. Uh, we released it concurrently with the Federal Highway Administration's put, putting brakes on accidents today. What was the report about? It was, it, we addressed the Connecticut Department of Transportation's fatal neglect of pedestrian safety. Uh, they, 16 percent of all of our motor vehicle fatalities are pedestrians. They receive about 1.8 percent of the federal safety construction funds and really aren't systematically considered in any planning or uh, roadway design decisions and with fatal results. What sort of things could they be doing that they aren't? Minimizing the, the width of uh, unbroken asphalt that pedestrians have to cross, uh, implementing longer pedestrian crossing phases, using more reflective uh, durable surface marking materials for crosswalks, using uh, full ladder bar crosswalks. Um, in general, restoring some balance between cars and people uh, in our roadway configuration. Another project the uh, coalition is working on is Safe Routes to School. What's that all about? Well, Safe Routes is a, is a movement that's, that's sweeping the world. I mean, it started in the Netherlands. I'm sure you've discussed it on your show. Uh, and is being implemented successfully all around the country. Uh, we decided to take it up in Connecticut because a critical link that's missing in a lot of our communities is that between the school, which is a community focal point, and the home and your ability to get from point A to point B on foot. Kids don't drive. Young kids especially uh, are, are subject to uh, the transportation provided them either by the community or by their parents. Uh, they lose that independence when we design our communities in a way uh, that's unfriendly or unaccommodating to pedestrians. 
uh, and all of those fantastic experiences that I grew up with, uh, the brilliant foliage, you know, writing my name in the grass and the frost, um, the first gorgeous day of spring, these kids are being chauffeured around and losing that. Uh, and at the same time that we're losing that balance, uh, childhood obesity rates are skyrocketing and have been declared a national epidemic. Safe Roots really is where we go into a community and work in a collaborative partnership to analyze the infrastructure needs of the community. Origins, destinations. We look for hazards, we look for gaps in the infrastructure, and we work with the community to propose a solution. Last year we worked with six schools in four municipalities, uh, had a fantastic time, and they're all moving ahead with implementing the plans this year. So we hope to see some real on-the-ground results shortly. And you talked about partnerships. Who all is involved when you go into a community? We have everybody who we need to make the decisions later on. We have their public works department, we have their police department, we have their planning department, we have municipal officials, we have the parents, we have the school, and if there's a neighborhood, a neighborhood group, a block group, we have them involved so that when the plan leaves the room, it's a consensus plan. There's no disagreement. So we're ready to move forward with implementation. We've cleared all the hurdles through the process in our workshops. Uh, we don't go into work with a community where they can't sit down at the same table because they're not prepared to undertake what could be a, a contentious and, and divisive debate. What connection is there between what you talked about in Deadly by Design and what you're trying to work on with Safe Outs to School? Well, it's, in, it's interesting you bring it up because we wouldn't have written Deadly by Design if we hadn't started Safe Routes because it was anecdotes that we got as we were interviewing the 24 finalists last year. Um, one anecdote after another where we heard, we wanted to fix this problem, but the DOT won't let us. They wouldn't let us. We can't do this. They won't allow it. There's no money. And when we'd gotten pretty much to 100% of the towns that we dealt with had their own particular DOT anecdote, we just started doing some research for our own purposes. Uh, and that really was the, was the kernel that led to the writing of Deadly by Design. We're in Lincoln, Rhode Island, talking with Mark Jewell, who's an outdoor recreation planner. Who do you work for? Well, I work for the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And what's that? The National Heritage Corridor is a, an affiliated unit of the National Park Service. It uh, encompasses uh, 24 cities here in the Blackstone River Valley, um, which stretches from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, down to Providence, Rhode Island. What's this trail behind us? We're standing on the Blackstone River Bikeway, which is... Um, a wonderful project um, here in Rhode Island headed up by um, uh, Director Jan Reitzmo of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and uh, in cooperation with the uh, Rhode Island Department of Transportation with Director Ankner. Um, this is uh, a three mile segment that's been recently completed here in Lincoln um, and it will soon connect to a three mile segment just upstream from here um, on the Cumberland, Rhode Island side of the river. Where is the trail eventually going to make it to? Well, this is, a, this is a really exciting part. This bikeway is connecting from, will connect the cities of Providence, Rhode Island to Worcester, Massachusetts, 46 miles long. Um, and in addition to that, it's been designated a section of the East Coast Greenway, which is a um, 2,600 mile bikeway that runs from Florida all the way to Maine. Now, when you have a heritage corridor like this, how does that work? I mean, what, uh, what role do the different uh, agencies play in, in something like that? Well, um, through the National Park Service here at this particular National Heritage Corridor, we were designated, um, the national significance here is the American Industrial Revolution. It started here on the Blackstone River with uh, Samuel Slater in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And uh, this is the first bikeway that follows a historic river and connects the second and third largest cities in New England, Providence, Rhode Island, and Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, we partner with over 250 different partners here in the Blackstone River Valley. We're in Burlington, Vermont, talking with Chapin Spencer, who is Executive Director of Local Motion. What, is, what is Local Motion? Local Motion is an organization promoting walking and bicycling in the greater Burlington area. How long have you been around? Uh, just about two years now. 
What, what sort of things can you do to get people to bike and walk more? Sure. As you know, what we're trying to do is really change people's cultural habits. And it's not often easy. Uh, we're very ingrained in our automobiles. And Local Motion works on expanding trails. Right now we're working on the Island Line Rail Trail. So it extends from Burlington up through the Champlain Islands. Uh, we're also doing a number of promotional efforts, publishing maps, helping people at our Trailside Center really learn about how to commute to work by bike or by foot, and really providing a service to folks to help them get out of their cars. How does what you do complement what local government or, or other agencies can do? Sure. Uh, we decided to set up a, a nonprofit to make sure we were isolated from the political winds of, uh, of the city and the county, and really wanted to make sure that we set up an institution of pedestrians and bicyclists that could be heard and, and would be heard. And it's very effective enabling us to be represented at all public meetings with a strong voice and to make sure that when any transportation project or even building project in the downtown area is done, that pedestrians and bicyclists are at the forefront of that design. We're in Brunswick, Maine, talking with John Balicki, who's the Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator for the Maine Department of Transportation. What's this fascinating bridge behind us? Well, we have a very historic bridge here. This bridge was believed to have been built by Robles, who I believe is the builder of the Brooklyn Bridge. It was built in the late 19th century here to basically connect Topsom to Brunswick, crossing the Androscoggin River, which is one of our great major rivers of the Northeast. This is a mill town. The bridge originally was a very functional bridge to bring workers from their housing to their jobs across to the mill. It was uh, rehabilitated in the uh, 30s in the depression by the Works Progress Administration uh, needs a bit of repairs now but it's also still a, a good functioning pedestrian bridge connecting to Topsom and Brunswick. You're a pedestrian from Topsom, you get across the river into Brunswick, what happens next? Well, it, it's a very scenic view, uh, an enjoyable walk across the bridge, uh, seeing the river and the wildlife, but immediately you uh, cross the bridge and come to uh, Route 1 uh, and an unsignalized intersection of Route 1 where actually uh, motor vehicles are leaving a, a controlled access portion of Route 1 coming into another portion but are traveling, still traveling at a fairly high rate of speed. Uh, and also there is a, a high volume of traffic and there is not a signal for quite a distance to control gaps in the traffic. So it is a very difficult, in fact, I would say as, as uh, the pedestrian coordinator for the state, I can't think of another place in Maine where we literally do have a crosswalk where it is probably more difficult to, uh, to cross uh, a, a simple two lanes of traffic than, uh, than right here. It's, uh, we have a crosswalk. The town has done, I think, a good job of putting at least some, some uh, yellow, green, bright warning signs, but that just isn't enough to get drivers to, who are going at a high rate of speed and often not paying much attention to recognize the pedestrian who's trying to get across the street. And at times, even the good motorists who do recognize if they put on their brakes are also risking uh, getting hit from behind. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation and a very difficult crossing. Uh, I do also serve on the town of Brunswick's uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. and. Uh, we are trying to look into some potential solutions uh, for trying to be able to uh, I improve this crossing and, and make it safer for people so people, the bridge becomes more functional and, and people might be more encouraged to use it. What are some of the things you might look at for a situation like this? What are the tools an engineer might use? Um, and, and again, I should say, too, our Department of Transportation as a whole is going to be looking into some improvements for the street. Uh, certainly one of the tools I would look in would be to try to get the street widened enough to get in at least an, uh, a refuge island, some kind of median, I think, would help to control traffic as a whole. And if we can get in a refuge island and just have to make the crossing, allow a pedestrian to safely cross in one direction and then the other, I, I think 
you know, that, that would be one of the most uh, significant improvements, I would think. Uh, we may also look into such things such as flashing pedestrian war, uh, warning lights. Uh, again, the, the intersection itself doesn't warrant a traffic signal, but I think we could get some hand-activated pedestrian lights that at least flash warning to drivers that will give them a, one of the big problems is drivers either aren't looking for pedestrians or plain aren't seeing them. Uh, they couldn't miss a, a flashing warning light system. So those are, are two of the things that, that would come to mind as potential solutions. We're in southwest New Hampshire talking with John Summers of Summers Backcountry Outfitters. What's this bridge behind us? This is the Ash Wheelett Covered Bridge, built in 1864, uh, built for the railroad in order for them to take timber out from this side of the river and mill it over on the other side of the river. It's uh, considered by historians to be one of the most elaborate or the most elaborate bridge, covered bridge in New Hampshire. What, uh, what makes it special like that? Well, it's an uh, unusual width, 26 uh, feet, 10 inches across. It has walkways on both sides, and it has a uh, very elaborate truss work. Um, iron bridges would have been available in, in, the, in that year. Why'd they build a wooden bridge? Lots of, um, lots of iron bridges uh, were probably beginning to be built then but the iron bridges cost an awful lot of money. They could build a wooden bridge and cover it for a lot less money. And so only on major highways uh, were iron bridges put in. Lesser bridges in, in the form of covered bridges, which had preceded them, continued to be built, probably up through 1900. Why cover the bridge? Well, uh, there's some speculation. Uh, some people thought that the bridge uh, was covered so that uh, the uh, young lovers in uh, horse and buggies uh, could uh, get uh, together under the bridge. Hence probably the name, the Kissing Bridges. But uh, in actuality, their reason for being covered was that wooden timbers uh, rotted very quickly because, of course, we didn't have any pressure-treated timbers then. So if they didn't cover the bridge, the bridge uh, would, in fact, rot away. So. Visit us on the Internet at www.pedestrians.org.